team is Sharon and I am the program director of iPrice. iPrice is a CDC funded research center with the core mission to reduce the top causes of injury and injury death in Georgia and the Southeast. Those leading causes are related to drugs such as opioids, falls, motor vehicle crashes, traumatic brain injuries, and intentional violence such as intimate partner violence. At our center, there are task forces for each focus area of injury that helps drive the direction of our research, education, and outreach. I encourage you to visit our website, iPrice, that's I P R C E dot emory e o m r y dot e d u to learn more about the center and the work we are committed to the region four public health training center is one of the 10 public health training centers funded by hersa to provide trainings and resources for public health for the public health workforce the collective group of centers is called the public health learning network they all work to improve the nation's public health system by strengthening the knowledge and skills of the current and future public health workforce. They serve eight Southeastern states. Their central office is located at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, in addition to their seven community-based training partners and three technical assistance providers. They provide public health workforce trainings and student field placements. Please visit their website at www.r4phtc.org for upcoming trainings, as well as archived recordings of past trainings. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Pat King. Pat King, RN, is a forensic nurse with extensive experience addressing the issue of abuse, neglect, and exploitation of at-risk adults. She is the manager of the Forensic Special Units, Special Initiatives Unit in the Georgia Department of Human Services, Division of Aging Services. Her specific areas of interest are suspicious deaths and abuse, neglect and exploitation in the context of aging, stress, and trauma. Pat has provided technical assistance on numerous fatal neglect cases at the request of prosecutors and investigators. She has developed numerous curriculums on a and &E, including a one-day course for clinicians called IMPACT. She conducts monthly trainings to Georgia coroners and elder, uh, on elder deaths. She is a frequent presenter at state and national conferences, and she has co-authored several articles on various aspects of at-risk adult abuse. She recently returned to school to obtain her master's in nursing and forensic nursing. Welcome, Pat. Thanks, Sharon. Sure do appreciate it. Can everybody see the screen yes, and hear me? Yes, ma'am. OK, good. All right, then I'm going to get right to it. And uh, for those of you who are here and are attending, I really appreciate it. And I hope that you're going to learn something as we go through here. I just recently ran across this. Um, quote from Dr. Alex Williamson, and it could apply to anybody that's in healthcare. I just think it's so on point. Um, quote, in medicine, there are two diagnoses physicians will never make. And again, that could be anybody who's in the healthcare. Public health um, doesn't matter. Um, um, and that's going to be the one they don't know and the one they don't think about. So everyone who encounters elders in their personal or professional lives has a responsibility to know and think about elder abuse so that it can be acknowledged, addressed, and acted upon. So that's kind of the point of this whole presentation is I hope that I will give you something to think about and um, that you'll know a little bit more maybe about uh, this topic than you did um, when you got here. And just real quick, some disclaimers, the views and opinions expressed during this presentations are mine and mine alone, do not reflect any organizational or departmental um, opinions unless otherwise stated. I have no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. And I present this in the ideal world, if you will, not in the real world. So if what I present is in conflict with your policies and procedures, then by all means, follow your policies and procedures. So I do wanna give you a heads up. Uh, there's gonna be a portion of this uh, presentation. There's some videos. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a tough topic. So I just wanna give you a heads up that there are some uh, photographs and videos in this 
presentation that uh, do contain um, what some will consider graphic photographs. So I've sort of split this into two, two different uh, parts, if you will, sort of what is abuse of at-risk adults and what to do about it. So I am gonna talk about abuse, neglect, exploitation as a public health issue. I'm gonna talk about it in terms of the changes of aging. And then I'm gonna very specifically talk about types and indicators. And those are where some of the, the graphic photographs will come into play. Um, then I'm gonna talk about what to do about it. It's one thing to, to describe it and define it and all that sort of stuff. And then, okay, what do we do about it? So I'm gonna talk about some of the barriers on both patients and professionals in terms of barriers to reporting. Um, give you some screening tips, some documentation tools, and lots of resources. So I don't want to just leave you hanging with, okay, well, now you just told us what it is. What do we do about it? So that's sort of going to be the gist of what I'm going to cover this morning. And at the very end, I do have an opportunity for you to ask questions. So if I will be asking you questions throughout the presentation, uh, so it'll be a little more interactive, but I would prefer if you could just to hold any questions you might have to the very end. So for me, my experience, um, Sharon talked a little bit about it. I was formerly a trauma nurse, worked down at Grady, at Piedmont, and at, at St. Joe's, and Open Heart, and the surgical intensive care units. Um, I also spent about five years working as a legal nurse consultant, and then really changed gears and became a post-certified or a law enforcement uh, investigator in the solicitor's office in the domestic violence unit <clears throat> uh, probably in 1999, I believe, but that's when I encountered my very first elder abuse case. And at the time, there were absolutely no laws. There was just nothing um, related to elder abuse on either the you know criminal justice side or um, public health, social services, victim services. It was just not a lot of anything. Um, I'm also a post-certified instructor, so I can do, <clears throat> excuse me, training for law enforcement. I'm a forensic nurse. I've been doing this for about 20 years now. And again, as Sharon suggested, my area of interest is what is a suspicious death? Just because you're a certain age and have pre-existing conditions does not necessarily mean that you're automatically, when you die, it's um, automatically an, a natural death, even though that's been sort of the consensus for um, many, many years. Um, currently, I am the manager of the Department of Human Services Division of Aging Services Forensic Special Initiatives Unit. And we're we're a very small unit, uh, but we're doing a lot of great things, I think. And we've just recently, as of February of this year, become members. We uh, did an MOU, a formal MOU with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. So we're now part of a, a bigger crimes um, against disabled and elder task force. So these are the four folks that make up the unit. And what our goal is, is to try to support those that do have boots on the ground. So. Um, if someone picks up the phone and calls 911, we want to make sure that that, um, that communications operator and anybody from that point forward, whether the case becomes you know, a criminal matter, or a social matter, a public health matter, a, a health matter, whatever, anyone that's going to touch that individual, uh, the, the potential victim in that crime or in that incidence or in that situation, we want to make sure that they know what abuse looks like, what it is, what, but more importantly, what to do about it, how to report it, and um, start providing some services to that individual. So we do that through training. We have four um, primary uh, training courses, if you will, that sort of target different audiences. We do a lot of technical assistance. Um, as part of this task force now, I get a daily list of all the um, decedents who are at the the, um, the morgue for the GBI that are either already there or, or in route. And so I look to see if there's history with adult protective services as just more information for the medical examiners to consider when they're looking at different cases. Um, so that's just one form of technical assistance. We do a lot of case reviews for prosecutors, for, um, for law enforcement, for adult protective services, for even for um, different sister agencies. And at the end of the day, what our bigger goal is, is to try to ad identify gaps in service or in the systems in Georgia, and then try to figure out ways to improve or to fill those gaps. And so we do that through advancing policy. And we put together a statewide um, abuse, neglect, exploitation task force in 2012, which is still active today. And with uh, very few exceptions, uh, just about every single year since the um, 
the creation of that task force, we've been able to change the law. And so that's one of the ways that we advance policy here in Georgia. And it's not just our unit. We do a lot of collaboration. Again, there's just four of us. We're in a very small unit uh, with absolutely no authority to do much of anything. So it uh, really requires a lot of networking, a lot of collaboration, a lot of coordination with a lot of other entities, state, local, and federal. So this is just talking about our, our task force. And the reason we did it was to, to expand and improve um, the response to at-risk adult abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So Amanda, you wanna do the polling questions? The polling questions should be live now. So the first one is, are you comfortable in your ability to recognize abuse, neglect, and exploitation of older adults and adults with disabilities? Just yes or no. Uh, the next question is, does your organization or institution have policies and procedures regarding abuse of older adults and adults with disabilities? Yes or no, um, or you don't know. Um, are you familiar with the changes of aging in the context of abuse, neglect, and exploitation? Yes or no. And then also, do you know the mandated reporting requirements in your state? Yes or no. And then finally, the last one is, are you familiar with benefits trafficking? And I like to ask these questions from the get-go just to sort of get a sense of who my audience is and maybe what I need to focus on a little bit more. So if you would just take a moment and answer those questions. And then I'm assuming we'll get the responses, correct? Yes, okay. um, we're at about 60% right now. Okay, good, thank you. And I'm gonna stop my video feed so y'all can just pay attention to the PowerPoint. Just one more minute. So how's it looking? Looking pretty good. We're at 85% response. Responses. Okay. Should I go ahead and then we can come back to the, res the results? I think we can show um, the Sure. I, we can show the results now if, we, if you like. If you like to end the polling, it'll show the results. Okay. Yeah. I mean, 85, that's a great feed. I mean, that's way more than we usually get. So that'd be great. Okay. Okay, and for those who um, answered, uh, you know, you don't know or you're, you're not sure, um, then I am so glad that you are here. And so um, I'm sure a lot of you are probably not gonna be very familiar with benefits trafficking because it's sort of a new thing. So um, I appreciate your um, responding to that. Okay, so this is a scenario. I just wanna uh, start you off, uh, get you thinking this morning. So. Here's the scenario, and this is based on actual case. This was like one of my very first cases. This is an 82-year-old female brought to the emergency department seven days after a fall, according to the personal care home owner. And this woman was in late to mid-stage um, Alzheimer's, so she was unable to uh, explain her injury. She lived in a personal care home with 10 other adults who also, everybody there had mid to late um, Alzheimer's um, disease. All 11 residents had unexplained injuries. And so when we took her to the hospital, um, normal vitals, she was alert and oriented times one. She knew who she was, but that was about it. She had a steady gait. 
ecchymosis to the left clavicle area uh, that went into the breast, because as you know, blood's gonna just go with gravity. Um, she grimaced with left shoulder, any kind of range of motion, moving her shoulder hurt. Um, and so what I would like you to do, um, and she did have a, a, a fracture of her left clavicle, is just name one. If you can just put it in chat, just name one red flag that you see in this scenario. 82 year old brought to the emergency room seven days after falling, mid to late Alzheimer's, unable to explain her injury, lives in a personal care home with 10 other adults with mid to late Alzheimer's. All 11 residents have unexplained injuries. What are some of the, your thoughts as far as some of the red flags you might see? Just one, just name one. So what are we seeing, Amanda, anything? Um, we're getting a lot of responses saying steady gait. Why did it take them seven days to uh, after the fall? Um, delayed reporting. Everyone else, everyone in the residence had injuries, unexplained injuries, more seven days after the fall. Uh, so, well, the, the good news is y'all pretty much hit on, I mean, pretty much everything in there except normal vital signs was a red flag. And then with this scenario, I just want you to think a little more broadly. You know, these are individuals that are, for the most part, they're in a locked environment. They can't get out. Um, who's getting into to them? Um, uh, if they can't make an outcry. Um, but yes, seven days after um, an event is unacceptable. And again, none of the injuries were life-threatening, but the fact that everybody had injuries, no one could tell us how they happened. Everybody kept saying, well, they fell. Um, it turned out that it was a lot of resident on resident um, violence, if you will, but also um, employee on resident um, violence. These folks were being locked in their rooms at night. They were being um, uh, chemically restrained. There was just a lot of stuff, really bad stuff going on. And this was back in like 2000. We had absolutely no laws to charge these people with. Um, I think everything we charged them with were misdemeanors. Um, the owner was the nurse. I was hoping we'd get a felony charge on her so we could yank her license, but we didn't. It was a misdemeanor. Um, but this was a case, I think it really opened my eyes to the plight of older adults who really have no voice. And um, so the end, the, the end of the story was everybody was arrested um, er, uh, that worked there. Everybody went to jail. Uh, they, were pro they were successfully prosecuted, if, even if it was just misdemeanors. Um, and um, everybody was relocated to another, to a personal care home where they were actually receiving care. So very good. So, okay, I keep talking about at-risk adults. Well, what is that? Um, under Georgia law, um, uh, um, we have uh, older adults, we have adults with disabilities, and then we have residents. So instead of having to say that over and over again, for brevity, we just refer to all three of those populations as at-risk adults. And so those definitions are certainly gonna vary by state. Um, so generally, it's going to be adults who are 60 or 65 and older, um, adults 18 and older with some type of disability or any type of disability, and then also residents of long-term care facilities. So when I'm speaking of at-risk adults, that's the population I'm talking about. And then you can go to the Elder Justice Initiatives website, which I'll put the link in here. And um, I am going to provide this PowerPoint uh, uh, to Amanda and to Sharon so uh, they can send it out to you later. So you'll have all these links and so forth, but you can look up your state statute there. So the other thing I want to talk about is just implicit bias. And as you know, those are your blind spots, the things that uh, you're not even aware uh, that that might be how you think about a particular topic or, or subject matter. So when you hear the words elder or older adult or adult with disability or Alzheimer's or dementia or long-term care facility or nursing home, what are the things that pop into your head? And I don't wanna know, don't wanna put it in chat. I just want you to be aware of it because whatever you think about those words is uh, sort of what you think about that particular population. And I want you to just be aware of it so you can put it aside. Uh, so when you do provide care or services or you know, whatever your interaction is with that individual, you would treat them with the same respect that you would any other individual. All right, so now we're gonna talk about abuse, neglect and exploitation or A&E. You're gonna hear that a lot, A&E, um, um, as a public health issue. It is a common and prevalent um, problem. It's detrimental to a significant portion of the public and to those who will love them. Um, I was just, uh, I was on a conference call yesterday and we were just talking about the, you know, the, the, the rock and the water and the ripple effect. Um, so when these, 
um, incidents of abuse, neglect, and exploitation are uncovered, it not only affects the individual, but so many other people that are connected to that individual. And so it does really have an, a huge impact on the, the, the public. And it exacts a significant financial and economic toll on not only the individual, but on society as well. So elder abuse is certainly a public health issue and is the public's health issue. Even though a lot of times you say elder abuse, people go, oh yeah, that's really a terrible thing, but nobody really wants to talk about it or think about it. It is such a bad thing. So um, when um, Dr. James Boulot became our director at the division in 2010, he told me, he said, Pat, I want you to pursue a public health approach to elder abuse. Well, I had no idea what a public health approach was. So Thank God he said that, and I did do a lot of research, and thank God for public health. I think it's just a wonderful way to approach problems, especially one that is as big as this. And so it just made so much sense when I started looking at it. And so that is the way that we approach this now. We look at the individual, you know, not only their biological um, conditions, but also just their personal issues, or not personal issues, but just um, like their determinants of health, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, just relationship, what's the nature and history of the individuals that they relate to and relate with, their trusted others, um, are they dependent, is someone else dependent on them, what's their social engagement, do they have a lot of support within the community, are there formal and informal supports available to them, and then societal, um, what are the norms, values, and policies that either benefit or, or you know, that are, provide ri uh, further risk or that protect older adults and adults with disabilities. And so at the end of the day, for me, all these are the determinants of health. So putting it in a social ecological contextual model, for me, I'm a very visual person. This just really helped me understand kind of how to approach this particular problem. So um, in 2016, Pillamer and some others did some research. So they were looking at all the different risk and protective factors, and they were wanting to see which ones actually had strong support to support either you know, what had been determined as risk factor, what had been determined as a, a protective factor. And as of 2016, there might be newer research, but this is what I've got right now, is really the only one that they had was for the individual level, the risk factors um, that they had strong um, evidence for. And that was um, if the individual is functionally um, at a, operating at a, a lower level of, of function capabilities, if you will, or is dependent on someone else for their care, for activities of daily living and so forth, there's strong evidence then that that is definitely a risk factor. If they're in poor physical health, if they have cognitive impairments and also low income, all four of those um, are, there's strong evidence supporting um, that those are definitely risk factors. And then there was also strong support showing, again, that social support, the more wraparound services and support that individual has, the better that they will do um, after abuse, neglect, exploitation is identified. So gender, age, financial dependence, race, ethnicity had potential um, strength as far as um, what is supported in the research at this time as um, risk factors. Now, when you look at the relationship, the community and societal, um, there's really um, no strong support at this point to suggest um, that the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator, what their history is, marital status, that sort of thing. There's potential evidence, but not strong at this point as far as risk factors um, for the community, geographic and uh, regional um, issues. Again, potential strength, not strong. But the one that I found the most interesting was for societal negative stereotypes and cultural norms were actually contested as a risk factor. So let's fast forward to 2020 with COVID, when I kept seeing on social media, um, COVID was seen as a boomer remover and other similar things. So I still think there's a lot of ageism that is um, sort of just accepted and tolerated in our, in our uh, society at this moment. So let's talk a little bit then about age uh, related changes. Common and uh, normal age related changes can mask or mimic signs of abuse, neglect, exploitation. Um, Laura Mosqueda is one of the leaders in uh, the medical perspective. She's a medical director of the National Center on Elder Abuse and has done a lot of research and work in this field. So age is basically, again, this is all very, very sort of uh, simplistic, but at the end of the day, aging is primarily made up of genetics, environment and lifestyle. And we all age, it's just that the onset, the rate and extent is gonna vary extensively from person to person. 
basically with aging, we continue to, everything continues to function. It's just that your system um, does not function as well under stress and certainly illness, injury, abuse, neglect, trauma, any of those things are certainly stressors to your body. So some of the aging factors, again, with, um, uh, with genetics, I think it's just amazing that they've um, identified aging pathways, genetic aging pathways that sh can help demonstrate if someone's at risk for specific um, issues. Uh, so there's metabolic, immune, uh, immune hepatic, and nephrotic um, pathways that they've identified. And what's so interesting is during this research, by having the individuals just change their habits, their diet and their exercise, they were able to decrease these markers. So it does suggest then that there are steps that we can take, even though we can't change our genetics at this point, there are things that we can do to mitigate the risk for um, chronic conditions. So that's the genetic. The environment is made up of all those things that we're looking at when we are looking at the determinants of health the financial resources, their housing, their safety, their health, their social services, their living environment, um, their skills and knowledge opportunities, especially with um, you know, high tech now. Do, can they get on a computer? Do they even have a computer? Because everybody wants to refer you to their website. It's like, well, that's fine, but I don't even have a computer. Um, recreation, do they get out and socialize, general environment, transportation, all those things that we consider determinants of health. And that's why it's so great that uh, you know, more and more we're starting to look at those and consider those, because that is certainly a part of the environment from which that individual um, um, is coming from. Finally, there's the habits, the lifestyle. Those are the things that we can address, that we can do something about, that we can change you know, our eating habits. We can try to get more sleep. We can uh, get more exercise. So these are the things that we can do. And again, um, it's already been shown that these things by making a few changes, uh, we can mitigate risk of um, future chronic dis diseases. And then finally, there's health disparities, differences in health related factors, the disease burden, the diagnosis, response to treatment, quality of life, health behaviors and access to care, which may involve race, ethnicity, sex, sexual identity, age, disability, social economic status, and geographic location. And I've been doing this work for 20 years, and I can tell you, uh, if you are an older adult or an adult with disability, uh, it almost feels sometimes like that population is just invisible. So it is very important to just consider the entire person, not just their age or their race or their ethnicity or any one of these in, um, in, you know, individual um, characteristics. So, um, we all sort of know what aging looks like, um, what happens as we age, but um, Laura Mosqueda and um, some of the folks out at um, the National Center put together a list of then they took it to the next level. Okay, so then how do these factors into abuse, neglect, and exploitation? So um, this just shows um, the different systems and, and the impact that um, abuse, you know, the 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 aging process can have then uh, to abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And the one that I think that I look at the most is the cardiovascular and pulmonary, uh, because those two to me are the most important. It makes it more difficult to recover from an illness and you have more severe outcomes from injuries. So you might have something that looks like a relatively, you know, not so serious injury, but that might be the thing that starts a cascade of events and ends up being a fatal event for an older adult. And I'll give you an example. You have a 35 year old who's assaulted and you know it's gonna take them some time to recover, but they're gonna do great. Um, an 85 or 90 year old that um, received the same assault, uh, they're for reasons I'm gonna talk about in the next slide, uh, they might not do so well and that actually might be a, a fatal event for them. Um, then with the pulmonary too, you have an increased risk of respiratory failure and increased risk for pneumonia. So what we see over and over and over and over again with neglect are um, pressure ulcers that have gotten infected because they've been untreated. And then the person develops sepsis and then they get pneumonia and you know it's just um, a really bad situation. So a lot of times on death certificates, you might see sepsis as the cause of death. So then my next question is, but what caused the sepsis? So this is just a, a chart of just things that can potentially uh, be impacted because of A&E with um, the changes of aging. So this is the thing I was talking about. It's uh, hemostenosis or just basically a lack of reserve. So as we get older, 
the available body reserves are just tapped out because they're already in use. So um, a lot of times folks will get sick, they get injured and they just don't have the reserves to draw from. They sort of reach that point of no return. And so a decreased ability to maintain hemio, um, homeostenosis under stress can relate, uh, can uh, lead to increased susceptibility to illness, um, increased difficulty recovering from illness or injury, increased sensitivity to meds and uh, lots of side effects, especially with so many polypharmacy that we see, uh, but also then uh, increased vulnerability to the after effects, if, uh, the after effects, if you will, of abuse. So, and this is a good illustration of that. This is a retrospective study. Um, some friends of mine did their uh, forensic nurses and they looked at 612 cases of suspected abuse. They were looking at medical records, state investigations, crime reports, and death certificates. And what they found was only 10% or 61 were substantiated by APS. The rest were not noted as possible A&E, although there was significant signs and symptoms of injury or death attributed to abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And once care was sought, it was too late in the decline. So this is what I'm talking about. It's uh, for th those other cases, it, it, they were just, it, they had gone past the point of no return. So the thing that really caught my attention though about this particular study that they did was the trajectory of elder decline was evident approximately 10 months prior to the onset of acute illness, injury or death. So there was plenty of time to have done, you know, interactions or to do um, interventions but just none were taken. And then this is just a picture from one of the um, patients in that study where the TD hose had not been removed for seven weeks. So yeah, of course they got a, a necrotic ulcer there. So again, um, it, that's why it's so important if you do suspect it to recognize it and to report it early on and you know get, get things in place to help that person uh, not only heal, but um, get through and get to a safer place. So what's old? So chronologically, that's just the number of years you lived and it's just gonna increase by one year every single year. So this is a guy, the first picture is him in his thirties. This is him seven years later because of a meth addiction. So at the end of the day, if a family member needed a kidney, would you want his for your loved one? And I don't think you would because biologically um, his, his organs are probably not very healthy. So then let's move forward and look at functional. So how functional is this individual? This is Mary, um, Sister Mary Booter. If you look up, just do a Google search and look up uh, Iron Nun, Sister Booter or Iron Nun. Uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of articles about her. She, um, as of March of this year, turned 91 and she has run over 390 triathlons. She started running in her 50s, just found she liked it. It was a good way for her to meditate and pray and have quiet time and so forth. And then she just started adding bike riding and swimming and uh, started doing the triathlon. So functionally, she's doing a lot better than the guy in the middle. And so that is why chronological age alone is such a flawed predictor of needs, function, and illness. You really wanna look at the biological and the functional capabilities of that individual. So give you a heads up. This is um, one of the videos I'm gonna show. And I think this is just an overview of abuse, neglect, exploitation, but there might be some graphic information in here. She had a pressure ulcer on her back, which when measured was about 11 by 13 inches. And you could actually see her spine. He kept hitting me and hitting me and hitting me. And he said, I'm going to finish you off. She would come around. She would knock on the door. And after my insistence of him not answering the door, she started to knock on the windows. I didn't like that at all. What she started to do was slowly consolidate her aunt's financial accounts. And she also um, had her aunt sign a quit claim deed. And that was done several months after Miss King was diagnosed with dementia. Unfortunately, there are a lot of different ways for an older adult to become abused. Emotional abuse, financial abuse, physical abuse, neglect. Sexual assault certainly happens in older adults. Oftentimes, people who are abused in one way are actually abused in other ways as well. 
one in 10 uh, individuals over the age of 60 are abused, yet only one in 25 reported. So the issues of fear of intimidation and embarrassment, I think, are very common. Not only is this a current problem, but it's become uh, significantly enhanced with the increase in population. And we have an obligation and responsibility to equip our officers with the proper tools of investigation and preservation of evidence. What the patrol officers do when they respond to these scenes is absolutely critical in my final investigation. When they're there, they can ask questions of an investigative nature that I may not be able to ask later on. Where there's a potential victim and a potential suspect in a house, we always separate them. Bill, can I have you step back here, please talk to me for a minute, just real quick. So the victim and the suspect can't hear each other. Talking to the older adult privately and asking, is anybody hurting you? Are you afraid of anybody? Is anybody using your money without your permission? Has he hurt you before? Dig deeper. Try to look for inconsistencies with what the victim could be saying. A lot of times, victims will lie to officers just to protect themselves from further abuse. Use patience and, and understanding. The victim may be more willing to describe what's going on if you're patient with them and and just are sympathetic and understanding. Just because somebody has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or some other dementia doesn't mean we can't interview them and talk to them, but it does mean we want to pick the times. So for example, there's something called sundowning syndrome, where people with dementia get more confused later in the day. Keep the questions very simple, very direct. If you need a time frame when something happened, give them anchors like, what was on TV at the time? Was it light out? Was it dark out? Was it springtime? Was it summer? Was it winter? Was it bingo day? One of the most important things is documentation of everything. Everything from smell <coughs> to sight to, you know, is there food in the house? You know, is there a place for someone to go to the bathroom, to wash, to brush their teeth? Look at the evidence. What does the evidence tell you about what might be going on in the home? Talk to the neighbors. Uh, look for other signs of violence in the home. When you do see some evidence of bruising, asking if you can look at arms, legs, torso, whatever the person will allow you to see is very important because as we know, bruises fade over time. Bruising that is on the head, neck, soles of the feet, buttocks, torso are highly suspicious related to possible abuse. This is now my house. If a suspected abuser hands you a durable power of attorney, don't assume that that means that there isn't a crime going on. A power of attorney is a document that authorizes somebody to act on someone else's behalf. And so legal ability to touch or move or negotiate funds is not the same as a blank check to steal those funds. We're finding across the country more and more multidisciplinary teams forming so that when that frontline person has a concern, they have a place to go where they have a reliable mechanism where people with expertise in social services, medical care, prosecution, guardian, all those different groups can come together and help figure out what's going on and what needs to be done to protect this person. We collaborate early. We talk about what to put in a search warrant. We talk about what photographs to take. We have these conversations because we're always sort of thinking to the end of the case. These interviews and investigations have to be coordinated in such a way mm -hmm. that they flow and uh, give reassurance and confidence uh, to the victim. Uh, they've just left a chaotic situation. What they don't need is a chaotic investigation. Having an advocate with me um, was invaluable because it showed the victim at that time that I wasn't, that police weren't just there to investigate the crime, but the police were there to make sure that they were safe. Adult Protective Services is in every state. Um, law enforcement should uh, know who the caseworkers are um, on their local level. They have information, they have resources, and frankly, they're really good at talking to uh, these victims. A lot of times they're people that they trust. And I appreciate what the social workers bring. And the social workers here appreciate what we bring a lot more. And the trust level has gone through the roof. When a patrol officer goes into a situation where an older adult is there and that older adult might be just sitting in the corner, not responsive, realize that's not normal aging. 
That's not what should be happening. To see if they're able to interact with you or if they seem withdrawn and afraid, that's a wonderful position that only a patrol officer might be able to really suss out for somebody. Police officers in general have a pretty good intuition of when things aren't right. See what's going on, what's bothering them, ask those simple questions that can potentially make a huge difference. You're not going to catch everything, but in the same token, just put a little bit effort forth, a little bit more, and might come out with something big. So this video, along with three or four others, were created by the uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police. Lou Detmar, who you saw in those videos, uh, is the chief of LaGrange, Georgia, uh, chief of police for LaGrange, Georgia. And at that time, he was the president of IACP. And so he chose abuse of at-risk adults as sort of his platform during the year he was president. And so during that year, and that was in 2019, these videos and a lot of resource materials were created for law enforcement. So if you're interested in seeing some of the other videos, well, actually you're gonna see some of the other videos, but some of the information, um, then IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police Elder Abuse um, section is a really great resource. Okay, so let's move on. We're gonna talk about the different types of abuse and some of the indicators. So if you go to the National Center on Elder Abuse, you're gonna get real specific definitions. What is, what's gonna be elder abuse is what it's gonna be, uh, how it's gonna be labeled there. And it's gonna be physical abuse, the intentional use of physical force, sexual abuse, non-consensual sexual contact, uh, neglect, caregivers or others failing to provide essential services, food, water, shelter, medical care. Uh, financial is misappropriation of money or property and emotional is infliction of mental pain, anguish or distress. So, but at the end of the day, when you say, <clears throat> when we are doing training for law enforcement and others, you say elder abuse, what does that really mean? Um, we started doing training on uh, benefits trafficking, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And um, officers understood that because they understand the concept of trafficking. But elder abuse is just sort of a, I don't know, what does that even mean? So for me, at the end of the day, here's what it really means. It's all these different types of um interpersonal violence that you see across the lifespan. The only difference is you now just have either a, a, an older population or a population of adults with some type of disability who are the victims. So where are the victim services for those um, crime victims? Or um, maybe it's not even, a, it hasn't risen to the level of a crime, but where are those, the services for older adults and adults with disabilities? <clears throat> So again, um, these the, the next few, probably 20 or 30 slides might be sort of graphic. So at-risk adult abuse generally is it's an act or a failure to act that either causes harm or per, potentially increases the risk of harm for an individual. So the picture on the left is a, a, child, um, a, a boy who's 18 years old, he's um, aged out of foster care. So his foster care literally just handed him off to a woman who had one of these um, clandestine locations and she was just collecting people, um, especially those who had either um, intellectual de developmental disabilities or mental illness um, so she could get their social security checks. And so he just became one of about five or six individuals that was in her, not her care, but under her control, if you will. And she moved him around uh, to 15 different locations over a period of three years trying to avoid detection. And his arrest for burglary because he was hungry, he was stealing food is what opened up that case. When he was being dressed out at the jail, which is this photograph that you're looking at here on the left, he just said, whatever you do, do not send me back to that place. Because every time he tried to get into the refrigerator because he was hungry, she would either burn him with a curling iron or whip him with an electrical cord, which are the injuries that you see here. Uh, the one on the right, I'm going to talk a little bit more, but he's um, someone that was also in one of these um, clandestine homes uh, being held captive against his will just for his social security checks. I'm going to talk about him a little bit later. But again, an act or a fairy to act. So neglect is clearly a fairy to act. Um, emotional abuse may occur in all types of abuse, neglect, exploitation. It may be degrading, humiliating, controlling, intimidating, threatening, isolating, taunting. Um, you know, just a look, um, just the tone of voice. And these are things that you can observe for um, when you're interacting with patients and or their family members. Um, and those types of acts then can lead to 
you know, a lot of different changes in the person's behavior and their mood, their personality. It can lead to depression, anxiety, eating, sleeping disorders, weight loss, refusal to take their meds. But if you look at the list of things on the right, that can be related, that be that can be because of so many other things going on in the individual's life. So that's why a thorough assessment, sort of a really get to know this individual is so important so you can have a better understanding of where this individual lives and where they're coming from. Signs that are suspicious regardless of the type of abuse is implausible explanations, no previous and or uh, like the, the, the case of the individuals living in that personal care home, <clears throat> no previous um, treatment or delay in seeking treatment, unexplained injuries, old and new, and inconsistent stories, and then sudden change in behavior. Um, again, this was another one of my very first cases. This woman was found on the floor when a care uh, in-home caregiver came to provide care. Um, the woman was on the floor, had blood coming out of both ears, had bruising down her neck and back, as you can see here in the picture. She called her supervisor, what do you want me to do? She um, ended up calling the son who came, basically just put mom back in the bed and left again for work. So uh, mom's still bleeding, still moaning and groaning. So uh, the supervisor, I mean, the worker called her supervisor who just said, go ahead and call 911, which they did. Long story short, the family removed her not once, but twice against medical um, advice from two different ERs that day. And we got involved, our division did, because I remember this was in 2008. I'm just thinking it should not take this much work to get an autopsy done, but we got an autopsy done when she died about four or five days later. And she had a broken neck. So again, at the time, there just weren't any laws. There was just nothing going on um, to really address this. So this case really just didn't go anywhere. <clears throat> again, just added to sort of my frustration, which um, sort of helps drive me in this work. Um, some other suspicions, uh, suspicious signs for physical abuse is just bruising in atypical locations, pattern injuries, which are consistent with the shape of whatever caused the injury, as you see here with the iron, wrist or ankle lesions or scars that could be suggestive of restraints, um, burns, especially if it's a stocking or glove pattern, which would suggest immersion, um, intentional immersion, multiple fractures or bruises in various stages of healing. Um, traumatic hair loss, um, any kind of eye injury, and then also intraoral soft tissue injuries. Again, any of the things that you see does not necessarily in and of itself mean that abuse, neglect, or exploitation is going on. But if you do see these things and you start seeing more and more of them, uh, the more that you see, then the more your index of suspicion should go up. And in most states, I know in my state in Georgia, it doesn't tell you, you have to prove it, you have to you know, substantiate it. It just says you have to have reasonable cause to believe. So if you have reasonable cause to believe based on what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're, um, um, you know, just the, the totality of the circumstances, then uh, probably as a mandated reporter, you should report that. So just watch this video real quick. It's just about 20 seconds. So let's say this, the um, individual who is a recipient of all that um, shows up in your clinic or your hospital or just in your, your setting, your practice setting uh, tomorrow or the next day, in the next 24 to 48 hours, you're probably going to see some facial bruising. You might see some traumatic hair loss. Um, you're probably going to see someone who might be depressed. Um, there's going to be uh, visible injuries more often, uh, probably. And you tell me in chat what you think is going to be the explanation given for the injuries that you might see. A lot of people are saying a fall. Yep. That's probably what we're going to be told that she fell. And so the good news is there we're starting to research is starting to sort of um, give us a little more information on that, which I'll talk about in a minute, but you're absolutely right. You're probably going to be told they fell. So these are some indicators of uh, just different restraints. And again, a restraint does not have to be a posy restraint, you know, a formal restraint. It can be anything that's handy when the individual decides, I need to restrain you. So it can be sheets, stockings, electrical cords, tape, just, you know, clothing, anything. It can also be chemicals. So the same, um, 
house where all the, the uh, 11 individuals lived with the Alzheimer's, they had a communal bowl of Ativan. It didn't matter if it was one milligram, two milligrams, half a milligram, didn't matter. All the Ativan got put into that bowl. And so because the people that ran the place had no knowledge whatsoever about Alzheimer's, um, for the behaviors they didn't know how to um, handle, they just started giving the residents Ativan, whether it was prescribed or not. So that was another issue too. We had a lot of over-medicated residents. And so um, that was considered a uh, restraint as well. <clears throat> also just different types of injuries. The upper left is an um, actual case. It was tried here in Georgia. Um, this woman spent six days on this uh, on the floor on a shower curtain with a compound fracture to her right arm. You've also got then a cigarette burn and um, periorbital ecchymosis, or basically a black eye. You've got um, the lower left. That's what uh, it looks like when your teeth get knocked out or get loosened because of a punch. Um, in the middle, lower picture, you may or may not see defensive injuries with someone who's had a stroke, someone's got advanced dementia, any number of issues. If someone's very frail, <coughs> excuse me, they just might not be able to defend themselves. So you might not always see defensive injuries in these cases. And then of course, the uh, um, lower right is um, an example of an immersion, an immersion, the stocking um, or glove immersion burns. And burns are usually pretty, pretty suspicious. So this is something that's really of interest to me is when we look at falls, 25% of people 65 and older are going to fall, um, statistically speaking, according to research. 50% uh, of those 80 and older will fall. <clears throat> that's leading calls of fatal injuries to elders, according to the National Coalition of, um, on Aging. So um, in January of this year, I went into the Georgia Public Health's OASIS database, which is an amazing database, by the way. And so I looked at uh, 2019, which is the most current data they had for external um, causes of death for 65 and older. So I was looking at homicide specifically, and there were only 32. And mind you, there's um, over, there's one and a half million adults, 65 and older in Georgia. So 32 homicides, and yet we had 681 falls um, that led to death. So then just while I was putting this presentation together, I went and looked at um, Healthy People 2020. And for homicides 65 and older, they had 2.0 or two um, homicides out of every 100,000 individuals. And then for falls 65 and older, 20 to 30% of the total injury deaths, which was 130 per 100,000 individuals. And so for me, knowing what I know about elder abuse, falls and A&E injuries are very similar. So I suspect that some of those falls really are in the wrong category. They should be on homicides. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that every death of anyone over the age of 65 is suspicious, but I would absolutely suggest that um, there's been a lot of deaths of individuals who are 65 or older, um, who basically it was foul play and it just slipped through the cracks because we, you know, older adult deaths are expected. Um, and so I think sometimes in the past it, that is certainly changing. People are starting to take actually look closer now at these cases. But in the past, I think basically if you were a certain age and had pre-existing condition, it was just ruled a natural death. So Tony Rosen is an ER doc up at Cornell University and he and um, Mark Lax and Laura Muscada and some of those that have been doing a lot of research in this area. Uh, Tony is an actual um, elder, I mean, um, emergency room physician. And so he has really started advancing the research in terms of what we know. So this was a study that they did and it was just came out last, um, last summer in July, <clears throat> excuse me, where they were looking at cases that had been adjudicated as elder abuse. So they know the injuries from those cases were, were inflicted injuries. And then they looked at a, a, a cohort, uh, another uh, cohort of uh, individuals who were very similar, except that their injuries were actually um, received in accidental falls. So they were comparing falls to inflicted injuries. And what they found was what Laura Muscata just said in that video. Uh, injuries basically to the head, the face, the neck, um, <clears throat> were probably more related to um, abuse, neglect, exploitation than to falls. And what they also found was most of the injuries are gonna to be to the left side of the face and neck. And what do you think that might be? Well, it's probably because most people are right-handed. 
So if you're punching somebody, you're going to be punching them to the left side of their face or their neck or their head. And so um, that's why a lot of those injuries fall to the left side. What they found with falls was scrapes, fractures, injuries were usually below the waist. But again, Mark Lack says this all the time. If you've seen one case, you've seen one case. So this is just a good sort of um, starting point to start looking at this and delineating these different types of injuries. But probably about nine months before he died, my dad literally just did a head over heels fall in a cracker barrel. He fell over a table and he was just bruised from head to toe. He split his head open, he broke his hip. Um, so, so you can't, you know, this is not a hard and fast rule, but it does sort of start lending itself to asking questions about the injuries that we see. Signs suspicious for sexual abuse. And yes, this does happen. Um, you have genital, rectal, or oral trauma. And depending, again, it's going to depend on what happened and, and you know, which orifice was, um, uh, I can't even think of the word. Um, anyway, and then also if it's, uh, you know, what was uh, used, uh, if it's, um, gosh, I'm just, um, penile or it might be a finger. It just sort of depends on what happened. Uh, there might be evidence of sexually transmitted um, infections, torn bloody clothing, difficult walking. There might The individual might be scratching themselves a lot. Um, recent change in behavior, adverse response to touch. Penetration, that's what I was thinking of. Um, there might even be pregnancy. Remember the case in Arizona, I believe, where the um, woman who had been in a vegetative state ended up pregnant and had a baby. And the first thing I thought of when I saw that case is there's a lot of other victims in that facility. Um, sexual abuse, older persons are often viewed as asexual. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter if you're 60, 70, 80 years you're, you're old, people are having sex. So, um, but because they're viewed as asexual, they're often ignored or that piece of the puzzle is ignored. The piece that might be they were sexually abused. <clears throat> um, Force unwanted sexual interaction of any kind um, is considered sexual abuse here in Georgia. Um, sexual acts committed against a person who's not competent to give informed uh, approval or consent. And then we get into some issues when you have resident on resident, um, uh, residents engaging in sexual behavior, but it's, you know, it's, we have to look at those on an individual basis and just make sure that neither party is being forced to do something they don't want to do or being um, unduly influenced or whatever. But if they're just freely engaging in sexual um, behavior, then, you know, that's, that's a whole nother animal. Um, adults with dementia and or um, intellectual developmental disabilities as perpetrators. And then also one of the things that's sort of lacking is we don't know what normal coitus looks like in an older adult. There's not a lot of research. So how do you compare what it might look like um, uh, following a sexual um, abuse versus normal? And um, just had a sexual assault nurse examiner talk last week. And she did say that for older adults who've gone through menopause, uh, the injuries can be um, a little more um, extensive, the internal injuries. Uh, sexual abuse, again, dementia and or physical impairment increase the risk of abuse. Predators, um, which would, are known as gerontophilias, and if there's a name for it, it suggests there's a lot of them, find older, older residents easy uh, prey, and they're probably not going to make an outcry, and if they do, who's going to believe because they've got dementia? You've got generational beliefs. Prior to Oprah, nobody really talked about a lot of this stuff. So if you're got a 90 year old, uh, they probably might not be as uh, uh, feel as free to talk about stuff as someone who's maybe you know younger. You have coexisting conditions to consider: incontinence, um, static moisture, vulvar atrophy, catheterization, um, poor diaper condition. Um, if there's fecal incontinence, and you've got a risk for severe sudden urinary tract infection and skin breakdown that could lead to sepsis. And then also the thing that's very important if a person is in a facility is the time frame of reporting for sexual assault. Um, even by CMS standards, it should be within two hours. Um, this is another one. This is um, a video on neglect. And it's probably about three or four minutes, I believe. Okay. Yeah, ambulance, yeah, this isn't an emergency, but my mom's got to go to the hospital. James Kirkland, the suspect in this case, his initial call to 911 was very, very matter of fact. Yeah, I've been caring for her at home. 
And she's got a, uh, either a bed sore or a hemorrhoid situation. That's uh, She's in a lot of pain. And when emergency personnel arrived, they saw something much more devastating. The police were contacted in the Kirkland case based on a call from the hospital and a subsequent contact from Adult Protective Services. When Ms. Kirkland was brought to the hospital, her compression stockings from earlier wound care had fused to her legs and they had to be surgically removed. And then she had a pressure ulcer on her back, which uh, when measured was about 11 by 13 inches. You could actually see her spine. We had been advised by medical staff that her wound, when she arrived, had been packed with newspaper and some kind of powdery substance. The son was uh, trying to do treatment on his own, not in consultation with the medical community, which really created a septic situation for her. I did not feel at that time Ms. Kirkland was going to survive. Once we figured out what exactly happened at the hospital, we triggered patrol to assist us at the home to secure it for the subsequent search. And her son answered the door. I identified myself as Montgomery County Police, and he immediately tried to step back in and shut the door. And I had to grab him and remove him from the house because, again, I didn't want him to alter anything inside the house. Patrol officers transported Mr. Kirkland for us back to the station. During that ride, Mr. Kirkland made several statements to that patrol officer. Those statements, spontaneous utterances. He just blurted them out of his mouth, and that officer was awesome took down that information and gave it to us when we got to the station in order to use that for the subsequent prosecution. And then I went in to interview Mr. Kirkland about the events. She hasn't been to a doctor in a long time, neither have I. And you know what, there are people who don't believe in doctors. It's really difficult to not let your emotions get involved, but I think long term that it's important for me to get that information um, and not to be judgmental or at least appear judgmental at that time. Did the That's best fine. job that I could do. Okay. He told me that medical care is very, very expensive, and he did not want to spend the money on taking care of his mother. After interviewing Mr. Kirkland, we did secure a search warrant, and myself and the rest of the elder vulnerable adult abuse team responded to that home with our forensics group. We had to climb over piles of newspaper and trash and just personal belongings. There was nowhere for her to sleep, nowhere for her to go. She did not have a bed. And we saw this white chair that she was sitting in. But it had pattern stains in it that appeared to be bodily fluids. There were pattern marks on our victim's back above her open wound that actually matched that chair. We did find a box of cornstarch. Which we later determined is what he was packing the wound in her lower back with, and then cover it with newspaper to try to soak up the weeping that was coming from the wound. Because her situation had deteriorated to such a point, we were able to move her towards a hospice at this uh, latter stage of her life. She survived for another month before ultimately passing, which the medical examiner deemed due to her injuries uh, and the care that she did not receive from her son. She had about a million dollars in assets at the time of her death. She had insurance. There were many other choices that were available to prevent her painful death. He was ultimately convicted of two counts of neglect of a vulnerable adult, um, each of which carry a possible maximum penalty of 10 years in jail. So that's an example of neglect. And some of the signs that are suspicious for neglect, as you saw in that video, uh, malnutrition, wasting, cachexia, dehydration, pressure injuries that are untreated. Pressure injuries in and of themselves are not really, I mean, again, you wanna look at you know, how many are there, where are they, are they infected, are they not infected? Does it look like care is being provided? Are they being provided the nutrition they need in order to, to heal that wound and so forth? So, but also poor hygiene, um, unchanged diapers, dirty, severely worn clothing, elongated nails, poor oral, oral hygiene, no care or delayed care, untreated injury, chronic condition. Um, any of those can be suspicious for neglect. And the reason I put in here non-compliant, um, if you work in an acute care setting or actually any setting, before you use the word non-compliant, be very judicious in the use of that word and determine why they're being non-compliant before you put that in a chart. Um, because it sounds like it's an active 
um, the person is actively not being compliant, they're not following orders. Um, when in fact, a lot of times with these cases, what we see is the person's being neglected and it's their um, caregiver, their family member, whoever, who's not taking them to the doctor, who's not getting their medications, who's not providing the care that they need. So find out why they're being non-compliant. Um, again, this was another one of my very first cases, just to orient you. It's a woman who was an above the knee right amputee. Uh, she's laying on her left hip, and that's her tailbone that's exposed, but you can also see how excoriated her skin is. She was that way from about the waist down. Um, she had been admitted uh, because of the sepsis, because actually because of an altered level of consciousness. Um, her foley and her, her um, gastric tube were both just nasty. The tubings were um, when they were taken out and, and changed and so forth. So Again, that was one of my first cases, and it just really made a big impression on me. The good news is she was sent to another facility and um, received treatment and healed from all of this. So these are just some different examples of neglect, um, severe cases of neglect uh, that have already been adjudicated. Um, so again, severe malnutrition, uh, extensive breakdown in sepsis and uh, the, the middle picture is a woman who required a lot of assistance just to get to the bathroom and so forth. Her daughter lived with her, but wasn't providing that care. So she was just literally having to drag herself to and from the bathroom. Um, neglect, you know, if they have assistive devices, hearing aids, walkers, canes, eyeglasses, are they with them? Are they in good repair? And are they working? Um, if they need a wheelchair, it's not doing them much good if it's out in the yard with weeds growing on it. Um, this picture with the pills, that's from someone who was self-neglecting. They were paranoid and was, were just determined somebody was trying to poison them. Um, so, but that just shows clearly they're not taking their medications. And self-neglect is not a crime, but it's certainly something that they might need some assistance and services and so forth. Um, just some additional examples of neglect, which by the way, is second only to financial exploitation is the number one and number two types of abuse that are reported. So I don't know if the heater works, but if it does, that's an accident waiting to happen right below it. That's an actual catheter from a case. That, I mean, that's not the catheter, that's the catheter tubing uh, that was attached to the bag and there was actually mold growing in it. So you can, um, I've got a picture of what the, the bag looked like. Up here in the upper right, the gentleman uh, was staying in a, a trailer with um, another individual. Well, actually the, the other individual was just collecting his social security check. He shared the trailer with five dogs and the inside of the trailer was just horrifically nasty. Lower right picture, that's a bed sore that had gone down to the bone and um, that actually was a case that made the, the, the news here in the Atlanta area. Um, you can have infestations. Sometimes when we have these um, unlicensed homes, these clandestine Locations where people are being kept for their social security checks and so forth, we can't even take the individual's belongings with them when we relocate them because you know they're they're just their stuff's infested with fleas, bed bugs, um, roaches, whatever. Um, also, a good way to check for neglect is look at their hands and their feet, their fingernails, and so forth. And then abandonment. We really don't have a law here to cover abandonment, so it would probably be treated as neglect here in Georgia, but that's uh, when someone's left at a hospital emergency department or they're just put on a bus or a train with a one-way ticket. Um, they're left at a public building. Um, just, you know, I don't want to care for them anymore. I just can't. So uh, again, there's probably other options available to the individual rather than just dropping an older adult or an adult with disability off somewhere. Again, this is what I was talking about with the assistive devices. Are they in good repair? <clears throat> um, if they have to use assistive technology for communication, you know, where's that? Um, and that's important too, if you're gonna go um, uh, get a history or physical from someone and they have to use those devices, it might be useful to sort of be familiar with those devices um, when you're trying to engage with that individual. Um, no or poor oral care, those are what cavities look like when they're left untreated. Um, signs that are suspicious from financial exploitation is also signs of neglect, uh, recent change in banking habits, abrupt changes in legal documents such as wills, um, powers of, power of attorney, caregiver failure to provide the care of the treatment, signature on documents by someone lacking understanding of the transaction. Um, if you put a document in front of your, you know, your mother, your father, 
here, mom, sign this. I'm, I'm, you know, don't worry about it, just sign it. And so I trust you as my son or daughter and I sign that and I have no idea what I just signed. Um, or I just might lack the capacity at this point to really understand what it is you're trying to get me to do. Uh, new names on signature cards, bank records of decedent versus caregiver, um, withdrawal of large sums of money causing penalties. Like when you close out a CD or something and they get hit with a big penalty and then addition of names on accounts. Again, any, uh, any one of these in and of itself doesn't mean there's something going on, but if you start seeing more and more of them, then yes, your index of suspicion just should go up. And neglect and financial exploitation literally go hand in hand because it's usually the financial exploitation that's driving the neglect. And so for healthcare providers, neglect is probably going to be the, the outward sign that you're going to be aware of. Otherwise, you might not be aware of the, you know, the financial situation. <clears throat> This is a catheter bag that that uh, tubing was attached to. And so one of the things that I think is so important with abuse, neglect, and exploitation is again, financial exploitation and neglect are the number one and number two um, types of abuse that are reported. They're also the, the two with the highest five-year mortality rates. So they are the most devastating for older adults and yet, Financial abuse and caregiver neglect do not cause a primary quote unquote safety concern in the usual sense of that term, like domestic violence or strangulation or any of those terms um, would, would raise, even though these are just clearly very, um, very serious and often fatal um, types of abuse. Asphyxia, we talk about uh, for a number of reasons, but certainly with a uh, frail individual, they fall out of bed, they get caught up in their rails or something, they just get in a position they can't get out of, then they're probably gonna die from just positional asphyxia, like in the picture in the upper right uh, hand. In the middle, if you're force feeding someone, you're trying to get out the door and you know, you're trying to get food down mom or dad or whatever, it, that's just an exit waiting to happen. Um, and then the, the lower picture there is a, obviously an enactment, but for smothering, the signs that you would be looking for are going to be very subtle anyway, and it's usually going to be based on the, the, the amount of effort that's being, um, you know, the, the I'm going to be really trying to fight against you, trying to suffocate me, so it's going to be sort of based on the, the uh, amount of um, fighting, if you will, going on, and if there's not any, again, you've got someone that's very frail, um, the things that you're going to see uh, normally would be very um, subtle. But in the, the case of someone that's very frail, you might not see those at all. Hi, Pat. Um, this is Ashley. I have a quick question for you. Sure. So one of the things that comes across my mind is how could um, a, a child, a, a cousin, a family member do this to another loved one? Um, what have you heard from people about how it gets to this point from this abuse gets to this point perpetrated by a family member? Well, it's a very good question. And, you know, 90% of the time it is a family member or a caregiver. So it's a trusted other of the individual. And I don't know, it's really, it, it, it blows my mind. I can tell you that. But it just seems like a lot of times folks will move in with mom or dad, it might be a grandkid, a son or daughter, and they're financially dependent on mom or dad. And at some point, because of maybe addictions or you know, other types of situations, um, it just becomes about the money. It's almost like mom or dad, you're just sort of a means to an end. And you know, it's, it's my inheritance, I'm gonna get it anyway. So let's just sort of expedite things. So, I mean, what's in the mind of an individual that can do this to a family member? I can't answer that question. I don't know, but we just see it over and over and over and over again. So, um, you know, I mean, like the example, the guy that, I mean, you know, she was saying he's got a, uh, there was a million dollars um, available to that guy. So I don't know if he was just hoping mom would hurry up and just die so he could get his hands on the million dollars, but it didn't look like from the overall uh, picture there that, you know, he's going to clean up even with a million dollars. So I don't know. It just, it's so different from case to case. And I know that really doesn't answer your question, but I don't know if you can answer that question. No, that helps. Thank you, Pat. Sure. I mean, sometimes I just think it's just, I, you know, it's just evil, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, with strangulation, yes, older adults can get strangled too, fatal and non-fatal. You might have neck contusions. You might not. I mean, even with um, healthy younger adults, you don't always have uh, marks 
um, because of strangulation. If you do, we always suggest to get pictures of ASAP because it might be a transient kind of um, injury. Um, certainly they might have difficulty breathing. They might be in the sniffing position, which is just the extended, extending the neck out so they can breathe better. If they tell you, if they're, you know, if they're still alive, it's just, it's an unfatal case and they're telling you they lost consciousness or they were incontinent, you might want to hang on to that person for some period of time just to eyeball them and keep an eye on them to make sure that their neck doesn't swell, that they don't, you know, start having more difficulty breathing. There might be a food or an object in the trachea. Um, there may be absolutely no injuries. Um, and also medications can, um, you know, sort of add to the, the picture as far as if there are a lot of medications um, that can further um, affect their, their breathing and so forth. Um, with strangulation, I don't think a lot of people probably had ever even heard of the hyoid bone until the Jeffrey Epstein case. But as you can see, the, the um, hyoid bone sits like right below um, like right there at the chin, you can see it in the, the diagram on the left there, it's the top thing, that's the hyoid bone, and that's right about the place where uh, people's hands end up around people's throats when they're strangling someone. So because of um, aging, uh, the hyoid bone does calcify as we age, so it does make that bone a lot easier to break, and so that's why you might not see that bone broken in children or younger adults who've been strangled, but you will in older adults. But the more important thing with older adults is with strangulation, they're at a much greater risk. Remember all those changes we talked about earlier, they're at much greater risk for cardiac arrest, aspiration, pneumonia, and stroke as a result of being strangled. So uh, something that a younger person might survive, this, you know, an older adult may not. And again, this is just some of the reasons that we're always looking at the asphyxia just because of restraints and so forth too. Um, oh, okay. This is one that actually was filmed here in Georgia. This is on these unlicensed homes. And let's see what kind of time. Yeah, we're good. So I'm going to show this video. I think this might be the last video. And then we can kind of get to some of this other stuff. <laughs> First time I spotted Mr. Hill, he was walking down Clifton Springs Road. It was just weird to have someone walking down the street with a sweater on, some shorts, carrying a big blanket. So I decided to turn around and have a little chat with him. Hey, you okay? Initially, he told me that he was being held hostage in a basement. A basement? I'm not gonna lie. I thought he probably was a little crazy, but something was going on and I was like, okay, well, let me see if there's some truth to this. Um, he was able to tell me his name, his date of birth, the last address on his license. So he was coherent enough. And he actually said to me, he said, I know I sound crazy, but I'm telling you the truth. I patted him down before I put him in my car. Well, he actually handed me some bent up nails. So he explained to me that she actually took the nails and bent them to lock him inside of the room and the nails held the door together. At that point, I put him into the unit and then we proceeded to drive around so we could try to find the house. I proceeded to ask him, you know, do you know what your house looks like? He tells me no, he's only seen the house once and that was when she bought him initially to the residence. Mr. Hill had been in the basement and he could hear what was going on above him in the house above him. Um, there was a family up there, there was a dog and he recognized the bark of the dog. That, that could be it right there. Right at that point, the dog is barking. He says, this is the house, this is the house. He's pointing at the house. Um, I get out as I make my way towards the residence. I come in contact with Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler was dirty. He had a lot of, you know, crust and stuff on his face like that. He was walking very slow. Um, it looked like he was malnourished. And she asked him who lives in this house. Do you live with someone in a basement? Um, and that's when he told her that there was another guy, but he had busted out that morning. Um, and she realized, wow, that this may be, maybe this is true. This is Mr. Hill. He came over, yeah. identified Mr. Hill for me. At that point, I asked him to show me where he was, you know, staying in the basement. He proceeded to walk me around the side of the house and we came to a door at the back of the residence. When I saw what I had, I called for some units to help me secure the location because it was a pretty big house. I called detectives, crime scene out so we could get a search warrant, make sure everything was processed legally. So the chain of custody was there. It was so wonderful that she thought to get a search warrant to bring a detective to the scene. 
to bring crime scene out to the scene, to take the photographs and to do everything properly. And that means it was all recorded and I was able to use it as evidence. While we were out here investigating, Ms. Faust actually pulled up into the driveway. She was in an Escalade, her daughter was in the passenger seat. At that point, I did transport her down to CID headquarters. This is Detective Russell. I'm out at Clifton Springs Manor. I'm out with Johnny Ray Hill. What's the living conditions like where you were staying? The door is locked all the time until she comes in to feed. Okay. Just twice a day. All right, what about um, sleeping? What do you sleep on? One single bed. You should see his damn bed. Yeah, that looks like a damn trampoline for a kid. What about shower? It's a, it's a aluminum bowl under the table there in the room. She fill that up every day? No, about every two weeks. What about um, restroom? It's a paint bucket, discarded paint bucket. That's what you do one and two in, peeing and shitting. Okay. And that's it. Anytime elderly or disabled people are exploited, it's always about money. The detective was looking not just to see what was happening in the basement, which is where the two men were living, um, but they also searched the upstairs. He found a bank statement uh, that had Johnny Hill's name on it and also had Chandra Faust's name on it. And she had actually added her name to his bank account and had been, that's how she was able to spend all of his checks. And we have actually had photographs of Chandra Faust accessing his funds. Now, did you ever talk with her about putting her name on either one of your bank accounts? Absolutely not. Did you ever let anyone else have permission to take money out of your account to a debit card? Absolutely not. Or did you give anyone permission to write checks on your account and take your money out? Absolutely not. The grand jury indicted Ms. Faust on false imprisonment, exploitation of a disabled adult, two counts of abuse of a, a disabled adult, and also two counts of theft by taking. She was sentenced to 20 to serve 10, and that means 10 years in custody, followed by 10 additional years on probation. It felt real good to see Ms. Faust go to jail for what she did. Um, to take someone's freedom from them unwillingly to me is very bad, but crimes against elderly people who can't help themselves. She was praying for her own financial gains. I think the most important thing that Yolanda did was give him some credence. She listened and she investigated uh, what he had to say, even though it sounded a little bit crazy. I think uh, Officer Shields is an excellent example of what uh, a police officer can do and what a difference they can make. You know, going with that gut feeling that something doesn't feel right and pursuing it uh, until uh, her concern is satisfied. Elder abuse is occurring pretty much in every city, in every county, um, in Georgia, along with um, throughout our nation. If there's financial exploitation occurring, then usually there's either abuse and or neglect occurring at the same time. Mr. Hill went um, into a much better place. It was paid for with his check. Um, it was not a homeless shelter and it was not somebody's basement. Um, I went to see him there and he was very happy. He was able to tell his story and he didn't have to tell it from beyond the grave like he thought he might. So Ashley, that kind of gets back to your question. I mean, how can you take, you know, human beings and just treat them like chattel and, and put them in a basement or put them in an attic or put them in a shed somewhere just so you can get their social security check, which is what these things are. So I, I can't really answer the question as far as motive. So trafficking at-risk adults for their benefits or benefits trafficking, as we call it, is um, under Georgia law. And I know it's going on across the country. Trust me, we've done enough, enough conferences and we talked to enough people. We just talked to someone, a detective from Las Vegas about two weeks ago. This is clearly on their radar out there now. But there's just not a lot of laws across the country, but there are here in Georgia. So under Georgia law, a person commits the offense of trafficking um, when through deception, coercion, exploitation, or isolation, they knowingly recruit, harbor, transport, or provide, or obtains by any means an at-risk adult basically for the purposes of appropriating their resources or basically using their resources for their own benefits, not for the benefits of the individual. So these are just some examples, some cases we've had around the state. Usually there's very little food. There's a ubiquitous five-gallon paint bucket that they use for the trash can like Mr. Hill was talking about. This particular case, the woman was playing the lottery, so she's using their social security checks to play the lottery. 
And it's not unusual, if you look at the lower left-hand corner here, it's not unusual when we go into these uh, clandestine locations to find literally trash bags full of bubble packs. And a lot of times the name on the bubble packs doesn't match anyone that's in that house. So then we have to ask, okay, who's this individual and where are they? And so a lot of times these individuals that are being kept in these types of environments, you might not ever see them in any kind of an acute care setting <clears throat> unless and until there's resident on resident violence. Um, sometimes if there's an assault, they might call 911 for an ambulance um, because someone's injured. But other than that, uh, you might not see these individuals at all. Um, the picture on the bottom in the center, that was just the only entrance um, to and from the basement for these individuals that were being locked in the basement. And when they weren't locked in the basement, they were being locked in the backyard. And then just uh, one of the beds of one of the residents in that particular home. Also, if the person dies, not a problem. We just dig a shallow grave in the back because we still want to get those social security checks. So we've seen several incidents of that as well. If you look here on the left, those are all uh, food stamp cards that were found in one individual's pocketbook, which is a crime in and of itself. But then if you look to the far right, there's dates and numbers on the back of the cards. Those are the dates that money gets put into the card and also the PIN number. So it's not unusual for these individuals to go to the grocery store using other people's food stamps to get groceries for their families. And then they'll go get the um, bologna or hot dogs or whatever it is for the resident. So this is the guy that you saw earlier. This is his name's Joey. He was found in a basement in August in um, here in Georgia in an attic and it was extremely hot. He was unconscious, he was malnourished. He'd been out there another day or two, he probably would have died. Uh, but the sheriff had been alerted that there were three or four men living in this, this home and were not being cared for. So they were sort of doing a welfare check and thank God they went on up in the attic and found him brought him out, uh, took him to the ER. He weighed about right at 100 pounds. And so fast forward about 18 months, this is him right before he testified in court. He had been put into a personal care home where he's actually receiving care and he had put back all his body weight back on. So um, yay, Joey. So that was one of the successful stories. So I just wanna talk about this really, really quick. Trauma response in at-risk adults. Um, if, you're, if you've been traumatized by you know, um, an act of God, a tornado, a hurricane, uh, you have been a victim of a crime, you've been held up at gunpoint, any number of things, uh, the trauma response just kicks in, you have no control over it. And so um, police might be talking to a 30 year old and they just cannot tell you what happened, you know, in a linear fashion because they're so traumatized. Well, if they're talking to a 70 or 80 year old, same situation, what's the first thing they're gonna think of? Well, this person probably has dementia. So we keep telling law enforcement, don't go there. Do not just assume someone's got dementia because they can't tell you what happened. The fact that you're even on scene suggests to me something's going on. And so by you know mislabeling it as dementia or psychosis or whatever else you're gonna label that uh, in that individual, then you've just missed an opportunity for um, not only to recognize it, to recognize abuse, neglect, exploitation, but to intervene as well on behalf of that individual. And so that's when the secondary victimization comes in. The victim doesn't make sense. So you assume it's dementia or you know, intellectual or developmental disability. And so you don't really believe them. And so then that's when the victim starts disengaging because they can sort of sense that. And then the case either gets closed or the victim just doesn't want to cooperate anymore. And so that's sort of secondary victim victimization. Mandated reporting, if you um, don't know what- Pat, before you move on, I'm sorry to interrupt, but- no, we that's okay. We have a question from the chat box from Cheryl. Amanda, do you want to ask that question really quickly? Sure. I was going to wait until the Q&A question, but that's fine. Um, so Cheryl had asked, given the prevalence, how do we continue to raise awareness and move to action in our collective spaces? Well, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Just keep doing the outreach. Um, I've started reaching out more and more to healthcare providers, not just criminal justice folks, just ongoing awareness, awareness, awareness. Towards the end with the resources, um, I think there's some really great examples. June 15th is um, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. So there's things that you can go ahead and start doing, planning now, sort of get the word out in your communities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, mandated reporting, if you're not sure if in fact you are a mandated reporter, I think pretty much across the country, there's everybody is, I just don't know to what degree. So again, here's that link so you can go look up specifically what you are required to do, what your authority is, and what your requirements are um, in your particular state. So some of the barriers to reporting, and this is across the board. 
um, for patients and for professionals. With the patients, they really don't want to cause trouble a lot of times for anyone. They uh, they just believe that you know it's payback. I was a really bad mom or dad, and you know, uh, or I was abusive. So um, I've just sort of resolved myself. Um, the solution, nursing home for them, is worse than the problem. So they're just not going to tell you. Uh, they might sort of just resign themselves that this is sort of my fate. Um, one thing that is very important is how and when you ask the questions. Um, I was in the ER probably about five years ago when I first was um, diagnosed with atrial fib. So they rushed me in, hooked me up. They're doing all this stuff. There's you know five or six people in there. My husband's in there. Triage nurse comes in and she says, okay, I'm going to ask you some questions that we ask everybody. And I just thought to myself, yep, here it comes. She said, do you feel safe at home? And I'm just thinking, you know, what a really bad way to ask this question in front of so many people and especially in front of my husband. Of course, I feel safe at home, but if I had not, I'm certainly not going to say so in front of my husband. Um, they might lack capacity. There might be a denial or they might, they might just lack the awareness to even know that they're being financially exploited or that they're being neglected. Um, they might want to protect their abuser. Um, and then there's just cultural generational beliefs that you know, they just, they're just not gonna, they're not gonna rat anybody out. Uh, barriers, again, for the patients, they're much more likely to disclose when they feel that the person asking questions really wants to know. Timing and context is important. That's what I was just talking about. And then time given for the response. Uh, with professionals, there's reasonable data to suggest that healthcare providers generally, regardless of practice setting, have a lot of difficulty in understanding elder abuse and manifestations the population generally recognizing it and knowing what to do if they identify it, and then just dealing with the anxiety that, you know, what happens if I do report it? Uh, again, with professionals, a, uh, a lot of times the, the, the complaints are more somatic. It's not really any of the things that I've just showed you. They're, they might not be very obvious. Um, additional barriers are just time constraints, inadequate training and experience, um, absence of a clear protocol if and when it is um, identified, and then again, just sort of the implicit bias, um, you know, doesn't matter if you're professional or not, you can still have implicit bias. And then so for the professionals, I just would encourage you to remember that neglect because of malnutrition, dehydration, sepsis, so forth and so on, over under medicating infections, trauma and or trauma response can make the individual appear to have uh, lack capacity or to have cognitive impairments when in fact they don't, you know, it's just all this other stuff going on. And when you're engaging with someone, um, anyone really, just be aware of your tone, your language, your attitude, and your body language. And as much as possible, try to be fully there for the individual. So these to me are some, yeah, you were just asking about opportunities. In the healthcare setting, this is great opportunities for the professionals if they got issues with time constraints, start an interdisciplinary team. If I'm the, the bedside nurse and I think, oh my goodness, this person's got, you know, I suspect elder abuse, then who's the next person you pull in that can start um, you know, working on those issues. Lack of training experience about A&E, then you do training, you get education, clinical experience. Interdisciplinary teams also can work because you start educating one another about you know, what you can and cannot do. Uh, more work if discovered, again, interdisciplinary team. By sharing the workload, it, it's, not, it's just better on everybody, including the patient and especially the patient. If there's absent, uh, you know, there's not a real clear protocol, create one. If you've got one, but it needs updating, update it. Um, so to me, these are just excellent opportunities to sort of address some of the issues that patients have. So you can sort of, um, you know, address it before they get there. Um, when she asked me, do you feel safe at home? That has been shown over and over again, just to be totally insensitive to interpersonal violence and certainly to abuse, neglect, exploitation. You could ask someone, do you feel safe at home? They're thinking, oh, no, I don't feel safe because, you know, my water pipe just burst or my neighbor just bought a pit bull or um, you know any number of things that have nothing to do with abuse, neglect, exploitation. And again, it's often asked in front of the family as it was with me. So for screening, screening tips, any clinical setting is unique and possibly the only opportunity to provide that intervention. And um, in Georgia and other places as well, that's one of the exceptions to hearsay is anything that is told to a healthcare professional because it is assumed if you're telling your doctor or your nurse uh, information, it's going to help them then determine a diagnosis and treatment. And so it's assumed that you're going to be telling them the truth. So healthcare providers may be the only outside contact to whom victims are willing to make an outcry because they see healthcare providers as, you know, professionals and someone that knows what to do and can help. 
So try to do a private interview, compensate for their sensory deficits. Again, we talked about their um, um, assistive devices. Beware of your tone, your attitude, and your body language. And just be aware that the screens, any of the screening tools are sensitive, but they're not specific. So a positive screen does not mean that abuse is occurring, but it certainly means that you probably need more information. And again, these are just some published screening tools that are out there, and you'll see those when you get the, the PowerPoint. Um, this is one of the Elder Abuse Suspicion Index. It has been validated for cognitively in intact patients, not for those with cognitive impairments. But it just takes just a few minutes. Uh, the, the first five questions you ask of the patient and the sixth one based on what you see and your interactions, you, you um, answer. Um, these, uh, all these are just some tools. They're just different tools that are out there right now. This is another one that Rosen and company have developed for the emergency department. It's one to three minutes. It's an algorithm. So you just follow the algorithm and then here are the questions that they ask over on the right. Um, this is um, again from Laura Mosqueda and this is looking more at the vulnerability specific to elder abuse. So they're looking to see, um, you know, again, what the functional status is, what the caregiver's capabilities and limitations are. Um, those sorts of things to sort of get a handle on just how vulnerable is this individual. So with this, there's three um, domains. The first one is the individual themselves, their medical history, their social history, their functional uh, capacity, their need for assistance. Number two is the trusted other. What's that relationship like? What was it like before caregiving ensued? Um, are there impairments? Is, um, you know, is the person that's doing the care dependent financially on the the older adult or vice versa? And then what's the context? Are they paid, unpaid? Is it a low quality relationship to begin with? Cultural norms, those sorts of things. So overall with screening and assessment, what's the reason for the visit? Are there visible injuries? When I went to the hospital last year for pneumonia and I don't spend all my time in the ER, I've only gone like twice, but last year I couldn't breathe, I had pneumonia. And so I'm there, thank God they were focused on my pneumonia and my breathing and they got my breathing under control. But I was thinking, you know, I wonder if I was covered in bruises, if they would also notice that. So where does the adult live, private residence or facility, just all those determinants of health that we looked at earlier. Uh, if they live at home, does anyone else live with them? Um, if needed, who provides assistance? Obtain and review medical history, suggestive of A&E. Uh, head to toe exam, certainly review of systems, their functional status, their cognition, and then their care needs and safety of the home environment. And again, this is where the multidisciplinary team approach is the most effective because everybody sort of can add their two cents worth and build a big, bigger picture. Um, if you do suggest or you do suspect abuse is occurring, that it's critical to obtain as much information as possible to um, address their, the implications to their health. Um, what, if any, ongoing access does the offender have to the patient? A collaborative response, so you don't basically, you know, provide an ineffective response. Discharging an adult to care of an alleged offender is just clinically inappropriate. Um, certainly, again, if you're mandated by law, do so, because uh, then that brings a whole other player into the, the field. Also, victim services, there's a lot of other external players that can be brought um, to bear like uh, Laura was talking about multidisciplinary teams, safety planning, and then follow-up care, so you can kind of keep an eye on them. Um, and then these are just some things to consider for um, safe discharge. Uh, their cognitive status, their activity level, their functional status, that's really probably one of the key things is their functional status. The nature of the patient's current home and suitability for the patient's condition. Um, it may be that they can go home, but just not right now. They're gonna have to make a stop on the way, like, you know, for rehab or for, assisted living or something before they can go back home. And again, the bigger thing is the availability of family or, or companion support. What are those social supports for that individual? Um, can they obtain their medications and services, go, get to and from the doctor, um, those sorts of uh, considerations. So this is just external collaborations. So these are some that we see here in Georgia. Within our judicial circuits, um, we have statutorily, if the DA wants to, they can start multidisciplinary teams for elder abuse. So these are sort of the key players. It's healthcare, the nursing home advocates and regulatory, uh, the oversight folks, um, adult protective services, criminal justice, aging and disability networks. Um, the things that are in red for us are the things that are critically missing and that's emergency housing. If we um, uh, say 911 is called because um, you know someone in the home had a massive heart attack and they're gonna take that person to the hospital, but that person also just happens to be the caregiver 
of someone who requires a lot of care, what do you do with that individual? Um, or if maybe um, someone's being arrested because of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and again, the individual that they've been abusing can't be left alone, what do we do? Or with these unlicensed homes, when we find them, sometimes we're trying to relocate 30 people at one time. Where do, we, where do those individuals go? Um, and then emotional support counseling, basically the crisis intervention, the things that occur immediately after, those are sort of the things that are lacking um, here in our state. Uh, mental health and um, intellectual developmental disability organizations are also going to be part of that multidisciplinary team. Um, you want to certainly document, 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 document. I can't tell you how important that is. A lot of people get concerned about what if I report it, am I going to have to go to court? The good news is the more thorough you, re, you uh, document, probably the less chances are you're going to have to go to court because there's going to be such a strong case, case is probably going to plead out. So again, the history, the review of systems, the cognitive assessment, uh, physical appearance before treatment, if that's, you know, uh, if that's appropriate. I mean, certainly if it's in a crisis situation, you can't say, hey, stop, I need to take pictures. Um, quotes of the adult whenever possible, document all findings in detail, all injuries, no matter how minor, uh, label injuries cor uh, correctly. Uh, if you're not sure if something's a laceration, an incised wound or a blunt force trauma, just put a wound complete descriptions of all findings. And I would strongly suggest photos. If you can't take them at your organization, you might wanna get law enforcement involved so they can. Um, also make sure it's complete, accurate, objective, orient references to the injuries to the person's left or the left side, you know, to, to their left or right side and avoid bias. Words such as alleged or claims give the impression that the person's unreliable or lying. You'd never say alleged heart attack. So just put, you know, person reports assault. Um, a, a, a suspected uh, assault. And again, if it's not documented, it might not have happened. So again, these are just some more tools. This is a Jerry injury documentation tool. And again, it just provides some consistency when you're doing an assessment, but then also sort of helps you with your documentation. And so for, again, this is from Tony Rosen and his crew for each injury, what's the mechanism of injury? Um, you know, what's the time lapse from the time of the injury to the presentation for treatment? How did the injury happen? What's the story being told? Was there pain at the time of the injury? Is there pain now? What's the scale? Who's reporting the history? Who's present while the report is given? Tenderness to palpation and how expressed uh, the precise location of the um, injury and the size. So again, uh, both of these are just tools for documentation and again to provide some consistency in the documentation. So whatever you're using at your facility is great. So at-risk adults generally just need the same, they have the same needs as any other patient who's experienced abuse, which is non-judgmental emotional support, medical care by knowledgeable providers, crisis intervention and follow-up, referrals to social victim and community services, person-centered trauma-informed culturally competent care. So these are just some of the resources. Again, these will take you to all kinds of places. So instead of giving you, you know, 50, I just sort of went with these three. Um, reframing, um, uh, the Framework Institute is doing a really great job of reframing how we talk about aging and how we look at aging, but also how we reframe elder abuse. And so there's just a really, a lot of information for the individual that was asking about how do we get the word out? That's a really great place to start. Here in Georgia, I don't know about the other states, we have the Georgia Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation app. Um, Adult Protective Services here is not 24 or seven. So, you know, we know a lot of times things happen after hours in the middle of the night and so forth. So we wanted to give law enforcement tools. So what this offers is agencies for reporting, agencies for resources, uh, Georgia law, um, the placement, the reporting missing um, adult and screenings, those bottom three things that are listed, that's really only for law enforcement. So when law enforcement downloads this app, we give them a, a code that they put in, which then opens up this other, these other elements of the app. But for, I mean, anybody can download this thing. And again, the, the basic information are the agencies for reporting and for resources, uh, contact information for just a plethora of agencies, and then also Georgia law. So it's just a really good tool um, for anyone to use. And it's, you know, you can carry it around in your pocket on, with your smartphone. So um, again, I don't know what other uh, states might have. So that brings us to this point. We have about 15 minutes. So I wanted to allow plenty of time for uh, questions and comments and so forth, if there are any. And I know that was a lot of information, a lot of chat talking. So 
but it is what it is. So questions, comments, suggestions, what's going on in your state? It's got a lot of comments thanking you for this incredible information, Pat. Um, one of the questions that we received is how people can find out whether they have a similar agency in their home state. Similar agency to what? Not really sure. It was just asking, is there an agency in a specific state? So maybe every, agency every, si yeah. every single state has a division of aging. So there's aging network in every single state. Um, I think we're unique here in Georgia with our forensic initiatives unit. Um, we're sort of an oddball unit uh, because none of us are social workers. We all come from criminal justice or trauma or whatever, the four of us. So, um, but you know, we sort of try to do stuff that helps the front end folks uh, by doing stuff in the background, changing laws, changing policies, and always try to make it easier for the people on the front line. So I think we're a little unique, but every single state uh, you know, you should just be able to look up uh, adult protective services or aging or division of aging, something like that within your state uh, to find out uh, what resources are available. Great, thank you. And we got another question from Amy Shim. She asks, what are some preventative measures or screenings that have worked in practice? Are there any regular check-ins or welfare checks with the family caregiver or does there need to be a suspected abuse to trigger? Well, I mean, that's sort of a loaded question and the, the answer would be, it depends. Here in Georgia, I know some of the different agencies are, um, they've sort of taken it on themselves. Uh, wait a minute, let me, let me open up my video thing here. So they've started doing, uh, for folks that um, are calling 911 a lot and it's just because they've fallen or you know they need some assistance sort of minor stuff, but it's almost like a regular thing. Plus they're lonely and they're calling just to have some social interaction. Then um, the fire department or the EMS folks um, sort of have created a separate list of people that need welfare checks. And so they've got like a, a whole different unit now that's going out and doing just welfare checks, but they're also hooking up with, with, um, with senior services and making them aware of some of the needs. So it just sort of depends. Um, on what the situations are. I don't know if that answered the question or not. That might've answered part of it. Great, and then we have another question from Cheryl asking, what educational information do you provide regarding marginalized populations, specifically LGBTQ plus? Well, I mean, this applies to across the board. Um, so, Again, if you're older and you have a disability, you're you're already way behind the, the eight ball and then anything else that you can add to that, any other sort of, you know, isms um, or um, um, other populations, um, it, it just, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of resources out there right now for older adults or adults with disabilities, um, certainly with LGBT, uh, with other populations, um, you know, it just takes someone or a group to sort of tag onto that and realize that there aren't a lot of resources and, and start pursuing um, things to make those things happen. I don't know if that answered the question or not, but I'm so focused, I guess, with the older adults that I sort of lose track sometimes some of the other issues, but I know there are a lot of other issues. Great, thank you. And we got another question from Nicola asking, how would one recognize elder abuse if they only talk to an older adult on the phone, such as with the telephone reassurance? Program? Well, sometimes it's the key things. We uh, get those, um, the, phone, the folks that do our um, intake and so forth, we get them to come through our two-day boot camp because it's just, you know, they might be just saying stuff on the phone that are key indicators. Like, you know, um, when I, um, you know, maybe something like, you know, I just can't get out that much because, you know, my son doesn't come by often or my son doesn't let me go out. I mean, there's, there's going to be things that they might be saying um, that they don't even realize they're um, sort of giving somebody up during the course of the conversation. So by understanding um, elder abuse generally, the more you know about it and the, when you're talking to someone, uh, the more that those red flags are going to really be very um, obvious to you, I guess. So while I'm thinking about it, um, I'm just gonna hold up two books here. And I don't get kicked back or anything from this. I just wanted to show them to you. Um, this is a book, it's called Elder Abuse, Forensics, Legal and Medical Aspects by Amy Carney. And it's a really good book. And 
Um, I bought it last year, I think, and it's um, easy to read, but it's a really, really good book. It was written by a forensic nurse. And so it's just a resource that I use a lot. And then also there's this one. It is the Geriatric Forensic Medicine and Pathology. This might be a little bit more information than you need, but since I do so much work with the coroners and the medical examiners in this field, uh, this just came out literally at the end of last year and it was by, it's by Kim Collins. So those are two good resources. Um, if elder abuse book. Um, the National Center on Elder Abuse has a lot of resources as well. So just the more informed you are, then the more, um, you know, you're going to pick up on these things in conversations, you know, on the phone, certainly when you're talking to someone in person, when you're seeing them in person. Um, but, you know, even as much information as you might have, as much knowledge as you might, might have, um, experts will tell you sometimes it's just really difficult to sort of tease out what is abuse, what's not abuse, what's benign, what's inflicted. Um, you know, some of them are pretty straightforward, but some are not quite so easy. So, but the more that you know, it's like anything else, the more you know, the more you sort of deal with it, then red flags just sort of pop up um, during the course of conversation or engaging with the individual, so. Great, and then we have another question asking, have you seen the Netflix movie, I Care A Lot? Oh my God, so I hate that woman, yes. Trafficking as we know it, any discrepancy? Well, I saw the movie and within about five seconds of that woman opening her mouth in court, I knew I didn't like her. But the thing that I think that troubled me, yeah, it was a great movie and it made its point and so forth. But the thing that really, that scared me about the movie is that it is based in some part on fact. Um, you know, guardians that then misuse that um, that position to basically financially exploit, but you don't have to have guardianship. You don't have power of attorney. I mean, any legal document that someone's using inappropriately and illegally to exploit and to financially exploit an individual is problematic. And that's exactly what she was doing. And it was based on, you know, some element of, of truth. I mean, I think a lot of it was sort of over the top, but um, I think there was, for those that haven't seen it, there's this, there's a scene where this guardian walks into her office and literally her wall is just covered in pictures of older adults who she has taken, you know, she, they're her, her ward. She's taken control of their um, lives. She's sold all their properties and she's making a ton of money off of them while they're living in, um, you know, locked in um, nursing homes and so forth. So, yes. I saw the movie and a lot of people that are in this field with me have seen it. We all just hated her, <laughs> but it is, I think it's based on truth, which to me is the scary part. We have another question asking, can you share more information about the two day boot camp that you mentioned? About the, the I'm sorry, about the what? The two day boot camp that you had. Oh, made? sure. Um, if you're interested, we do that virtually. So it's a two-day boot camp. And, it, you know, again, we're in Georgia, so it's specific to Georgia law. But the other stuff we talk about is just abuse, neglect, uh, and um, exploitation generally. And it's done virtually. So if you're interested in attending, I think we're already booked up for um, April, but we've got May and June coming up. Um, but we offer it up once a month. And... Um, it's a really great class. The trainers, uh, David Blake and Anna Thomas um, are very knowledgeable. David's a certified fraud examiner. He was a white collar. In fact, uh, Gene Canavan, the DA that prosecuted that uh, case of, um, of benefits trafficking in the cab, he used to work for her for eight years. So he's very knowledgeable uh, about the financial components of um, these types of crimes. So if you're interested, you're more than welcome to attend. Um, again, it's a two-day boot camp, and anyone is welcome. Again, it's the the law is going to be specific to Georgia, but you know, abuse is abuse is abuse, no matter where it is. And we cover just sort of the population. Some of the stuff that I've talked about, you're going to go through indicators. There's a whole module on just the benefits trafficking, crimes and facilities. Uh, we do a um, I do a, a one-hour module on suspicious deaths. Um, we talk about investigations, multidisciplinary teams, just cover a lot of material. So you're all welcome to attend if you're interested. Any other questions, comments? I just turned 65 last year. So for me, it's like become even more important now to clear this stuff up. <laughs> 
Well, Pat, we want to say thank you so much to you for this really important information. It's been incredibly helpful. Um, Amanda is recording this session. It will be posted on the Injury Prevention Research Center's website and our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you're interested in re-watching this presentation, it will be available there. Amanda will also share with you all resources, the presentation slide deck, the names of the incredible books that Pat mentioned earlier, and an email. Please make sure to respond to the post survey that we'll send out immediately to you after this session ends. Um, we really like your feedback. Um, and again, thank you to Pat and thank you for Region 4 Public Health Training Center for helping us to organize and put this together. Yes, thank you very much, Region 4 and iPrice. I definitely, absolutely appreciate the time. Thank you so much.